this study is huge. We could talk about urban wildlife all day long. Uh, so to pare it down, we're going to briefly talk about the basic requirements of wildlife and then how you identify what animals you have in your yards or what animals you have in your urban environment and how do you identify the animal? How do you identify the traces of that animal? And then the general uh, damage management practices that we can do. Uh, we are gonna provide you a table that you can use at home. And Mayor's gonna get that up to you in a sec. And then also at the end, I'm gonna give you another option to screenshot this QR code. The QR code is my personal evaluation. That's just five questions long but it also uh, gives you an opportunity to ask me for additional help. So if you have a particular problem that this presentation doesn't fix all the way, you can contact me through that QR code or just by emailing me and we can work on that problem a little bit further. Most of the time when people are contacting me about urban wildlife, they wanna know how they, how they manage them in their yards or in their out, out properties. And the first thing I talk about is modification. So how do we modify our behavior and how do we modify the habitat so that th we don't see the problems? And basically you want to look at their, their needs, their basic needs and what sources you have in your yard that are providing those needs. The basic needs are food, so year round, different foods will change throughout the year and their needs for those foods change throughout the year. All animals need water. Some wildlife get water from their environment. Some wildlife get water from open water sources, like in your backyard, it may be a bird bath. Some animals never drink open water. They only get water from the plants around them. Then all animals need shelter. So the type of shelter is what is changing. Most animals throughout the year are going to need shelter from the environment. So whether it's a snowstorm or intense heat, um, if you're a prey species like a mouse, you need shelter from predators. And then at some point during the year, animals are going to need some sort of shelter to rear their young. And that could be the same shelter that they're using year round, or it could just be a different form of shelter altogether. Then we consider how those three basic needs are arranged in the environment. So how much space is that animal using on a daily basis or a weekly basis to get to all those basic needs? And that's what we consider when we look at how an animal is using someone's urban environment and how to modify that environment. If that doesn't work, then when we move on to animal removal, whether that's lethal control or non-lethal control. Uh, sometimes we might just go right to animal removal if there's a health and human safety concern. There's a variety of lethal control strategies. And I think a lot of people wanna go straight to lethal control because they think it's quicker and easier. And it actually isn't. Uh, there's more drawbacks than benefits. It takes a lot of time to set up um, and it takes a lot of time to remove enough of the animals to get the impact you want sometimes. If you can't control your neighbors and what they're doing with their yards, sometimes you become a sink in that the more animals you remove, the more animals are moving in from your neighboring property and just causing the problem all over again because you're not really fixing the problem. You're not addressing those needs of the animal, you're just, removing the animal, but all those resources still exist. And then finally, there's a lot of state and federal permits and specifications that go along with lethal control. Um, sometimes it's not very simple to do that. And sometimes it's um, not legal to live catch an animal and move it. So we almost always pair any kind of animal removal with habitat modification. I can't go over every single issue in detail, and I can't go over every single solution in detail, but we're going to just kind of look at generally when the damage occurs, why it occurs, and what's lacking in the natural environment that's available in your environment. And the table that's becoming available for you, uh, you can fill in as we go and use that in the future. A lot of times, just knowing 
what animals are around during the day or what animals are around during the night and what types of damage look like can help you figure out what animal you're actually dealing with. We're gonna go over the usual suspects. So there are tons of wildlife out there. Some of them you'll never see in an urban environment. Sometimes you'll see them, but they're not causing any damage issues. So we're gonna talk about the ones that I get phone calls about or emails about throughout the year. We're gonna go from smallest to largest. So the smallest animals that we're dealing with are our native mice. Those are deer mice, pocket mice, grasshopper mice, pinion mouse. Um, they go by a different name. Uh, a lot of times they're incredibly hard to distinguish one from the other. You're looking really at just what the native habitat looks like to figure out which one of those species you're looking at. And they form the same function. So we're just gonna kind of lump them all in as deer mice or native mice. You can identify them because they're bicolored. So they have a generally uh, this dark back and then a white underbelly and their tails are bicolored as well. So they have fur on their tails. The fur on the top is dark and the fur on the bottom is light. They can be up to eight inches long. So they're usually about seven to eight inches long and they weigh about an ounce. They're primarily nocturnal and they're predominantly outside. These guys are gonna cause you issues with outside features, not with your inside attics and things like that. Most of the activity that we see um, is gonna be spring and fall. They do estivate, meaning that they go to sleep when it's really hot outside, and they hibernate when it's really cold outside. If they're hibernating in the winter and it gets a little bit warm, they might come out, get some more food, and then go back to sleep. Their native food are seeds and bark and berries in the native environments. They're looking at your property for your garden vegetables and fruit and your seeds and possibly the barks of, of your ornamental trees if they're highly nutritious. These guys get a lot of their water from the environment. So your lush vegetation is really attractive to them. Natively, they'll look They'll be in rocks and cracks and old burrows. They do live in burrows underground and they nest with their young in burrows underground. If they're in an urban or suburban environment, they could be in your walls of outbuildings and sheds, usually not your house. Um, they can also nest in your rubbish. So I've had issues where people put old furniture or old mattresses outside and they will get uh, deer mice living in those mattresses and pieces of furniture. Conversely, we have the house mouse. Now the house mouse is not native to the United States. It's native to Europe. You can tell the difference because it's all one color, usually a brownish grayish color. It also has a naked tail. So there's no fur on the tail, but it's about the same size and um, about as long as its body. So other than the color, you wouldn't really notice the difference. The difference in behavior is that they can live in higher densities. So house mice are communal or com what we call commensal, meaning they can form large colonies in one area. And they do like to be inside. So they don't mind living in your house. They are native of Europe. So they're used to high density cities and they don't mind being there. Uh, they are nocturnal, and because they are more often living inside, you can see activity from house mice year-round. Similar to our native species of mice, they do like the garden fruits and vegetables and outbuildings for shelter. They also like what I call untended berms, so edges of your property where there is no maintenance, or maybe you have an irrigation ditch by your property, that has a lot of overgrown vegetation. They, they like being there as well. Regardless of the species, they kind of have the same traces. The holes are about the size of a dime. So little teeny tiny spaces. They just need to get their skulls through and then the rest of their body can compress through that hole. Your damage is predominantly going to be in the spring and the fall when they're eating garden vegetables and crops, orchard fruits and things like that. And you can tell that it's a mouse because they've got this sort of rice 
green shaped feces that's pretty tiny and you'll see it where they nest and feed. So here we have a sack of grain that's got uh, feces all over it. Um, here you can see times got hard, they couldn't find anything else to eat, so they started nibbling at the bark. This can cause damage to your ornamental trees um, and your fruit trees, so that can be a problem. And then finally, you can see where these mice have set up home inside an uh, abandoned building, and they just ate through the insulation. You can see here they have the burrows and the holes running in and out of that insulation. So just basic damage management ideas. You can use exclusion methods. It, that's a little bit challenging because you have to find all openings greater than a quarter of an inch. And generally uh, commercial practices will use this steel wire mesh that you see on the left-hand side. It's really hard for the mice to get through. Rats can probably nibble through it eventually, but mice not really. More often people are gonna use toxicants to get rid of mice. There are some relatively uh, more acceptable toxicants on the market. There's bromethylin, which is a neurotoxin, and colocalciferol, which is uh, basically just calcium. It, it gets absorbed into the body and creates, creates toxic levels of calcium in the system. So these are a little bit safer to use in urban and rural or suburban situations as compared to rural uses. Um, it's also very common to use snap traps. So just the, like your Victor traps with the cardboard and the little spring. I also put up live catching because if you have a native mouse, so a deer mouse, the bicolored ones in your house, it's usually by accident. They don't really wanna be in your house. They might wanna be in your outbuildings, but not your house. So you could actually live catch them with any of the traps that are found on the market at your local farming supply stores and just release it outside and it will you'll never see it again and it won't come back. Habitat modifications can be a little challenging. Um, just basically reduce the shelter that's available for them outside. So don't leave your mattresses outside. Uh, don't leave uh, rubbish bins open outside and then remove access to food. So instead of putting a bag of grain in your shed, put the grain in a animal proof bin. So these things will reduce the shelter available and reduce the food available. And so then you'll just have generally less mice in the area to deal with. I do wanna issue a warning, don't clean up mouse waste without personal protective equipment. Mice, particularly deer mice, carry hantavirus, which is a pulmonary disease. Um, and it is, it's a fungus that's released into the air when you're trying to clean up the waste. So not a ton of people get this every year, but they do. And it is fairly lethal, if not diagnosed quickly. Um, so you want to use a ventilating mask if you're cleaning up mouse waste in a shed or any closed in area. Moving on to a very similar species are voles. These guys look like mice. Most people think they are mice, but they Thank behave you. different. Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to say I um, I put your the link to your table in chat if people wanted to open that and um, fill it out. Perfect. Thank you for doing that. So voles behave differently, so I wanted to differentiate them from the mice. They look different. They basically look like mice without tails. We have sagebrow, sagebrush mite voles, long-tailed voles, and then a montane vole, which looks like the long-tailed vole. And you can see the long-tailed vole has a bit of a tail, but it's far shorter than the size of its body. And that's a distinguishing feature. They also have ears that don't stick out above their head and relatively small eyes. So if you see this animal moving through the environment, that looks like it doesn't have ears or eyes or a tail, that's a vole. They are commonly found in fields, but they have uh, figured out how to live successfully in orchards. They are diurnal, so you will see them running around during the day and they are active year round. In fact, a lot of the damage happens in the winter time 
when they're running around under the snow and people don't realize they have the damage until the spring. In native environments, they're eating grasses and seeds and they expand that to eat vegetables and tubers, uh, bulbs and things like that, as well as orchard bark in urban and suburban environments. Naturally, they have the shallow burrow systems in long grass. So one vole may have three or four hole openings on your property with an extensive burrow system connecting those holes. The hole sizes are pretty in, easy to distinguish from mice. They're 0.75 to one inches long um, as far as the trace goes. And here you can see the track that's formed from them running back and forth from their hole. It's about an inch wide, three quarters of an inch wide. And the arrows are pointing to the feces. So the feces are shaped just like mice feces and you'll see them in the tracks. So they let loose their feces as they're running. And you can see it can even be under the soil, just sort of under the grass cutting through. And they are, they are particularly making these tracks in the winter time under the snow, but you just don't see them until the snow melts. And then you're like, oh my gosh, what the heck is running through my yard? So this is what the damage might look like. Um, in this hay field, they had some runs here. Here's a couple different holes. You also might see a situation like this where the tree has died, but there's no visible way to distinguish what killed it. And that's because the voles are eating the roots and the shoots under the ground without leaving any surface evidence. This also happens with ornamental bulbs, but they're also really good at eating your potatoes and turnips and radishes and carrots. We can do a few things to uh, have some damage management for voles. Particularly with the trees in the right before winter, you wanna wrap them with some protective cloth. We, if you know that you're in an area with a lot of voles, you can put woven mesh around the root ball of new trees when you uh, plant them, that, that will help them year round. You can reduce the shelter by mowing your grass short. You can burn those waste areas or ditches to keep the cover low. Uh, you can till the soil if that's appropriate. Um, obviously, if it's your front yard, you don't wanna do that. Another thing that also helps is to create a, some sort of buffer of open space. I like to say you can mulch areas around your garden beds, uh, like six feet wide, and the vole won't want to run that far unexposed to get to your garden, so it will minimize the activity there. Um, there are toxicants that are available, such as warfarin, and difacinone, these are called second generation anticoagulants. The vole has to eat two or three doses to make it a lethal dose. And it basically breaks down the capillary action within the body. And um, I, I wouldn't say it bleeds out, but it, it lowers the blood pressure to the point where the animal can no longer live. We can also use snap traps. And um, there's some pretty clever ways of using snap traps. I'm going to uh, try to share the video with you. Um, and let's see if I can make this happen. I did it once before. So <laughs> we'll see if we can do it again. Um, I wanna go ahead and click that open and share my screen with you, a new share. Be sure to select the audio share. Yeah, I think I did. So let's make sure that worked. I'm Trevor with the grass pad. No so I'm just going to fast forward. We don't need to see the whole thing. Thank you, Trevor. Okay. On either side of the burrow, where the bull will be, will have to make a decision to come out and go left or go right. What we did was to secure the mouse trap so when it sets, it doesn't bobble around. We drilled a small hole in, uh, in the center of the trap with a four inch nail to secure the trap. So when it sets, it really comes down on the neck of the of the bowl. how we came up with this little contraption here. All we did was take a, a small cardboard box, cut out one side, fold it in, 
a few sides here. You can use nails, anything that you can bend in, in this sort of fashion and secure it down. These are really great options um, if you have pets or animals um, in the vicinity. What he's doing is just putting a cover over it so that the dogs or cats can't get into these nest traps. Okay, we've got an So that's the basic gist of how to do a, a vole trap. It works really well. Uh, again, because it's got that cardboard covering over it, you can minimize any exposure from cats or dogs. Because they are active during the day, when you set these, you want to check them periodically through the day, and chances are you'll have gotten your vole by the end of the day. Moving on in size to commensal rats. These commensal rats are not native. Again, they're native to Europe, not North America. And because it, we are terming them commensal, it means that they live in large colonies, sometimes upwards of a thousand, not a thousand, sorry, a hundred, sometimes it feels like a thousand, a hundred rats in one area. We have the Norway rat and the, and the black rat. Black rats are often called roof rats. So in native environments, they would live in trees and in urban and suburban environments, they like roofs and attics. Norway rats are more uh, suburban per se. Uh, they don't really want to live in your house as much as they want to live in a shed or an outbuilding somewhere. They are mostly nocturnal, although you can see them in the evening or in the morning. And because they can live amongst people in urban environments, they can be active year round. Now, if they happen to be setting up shop in an area that does get cold, or resources are limited in the fall, fall and winter, they will hibernate for short periods of time. In a native environment, um, I guess people can't really remember what a rat's native environment looks like anymore because they've been living with humans for thousands of years, but technically they would eat seeds and fruits and leaves and twigs. And of course, now they eat human source food as well. Again, a native shelter, hard to describe because they just live everywhere, um, but brushes, bushes, burrows. They do dig their own burrow systems. Again, roof rats would like to live in trees. Um, we have problems with them in island habitat living in trees. Most of the damage is really going to be in household issues. So getting into a house, getting into an attic, setting up camp in a shed or a hay barn. But we do see a huge problem with them eating orchard fruits and nuts. This picture on the top right is uh, damage to an almond crop. Their holes are pretty distinctive. They're two and a half inches wide and they're perfectly round. So it's really easy to see uh, rat burrows. And again, the droppings are relatively distinctive. Uh, they're a little bit more than a half inch in size. And you can see here that we've kind of compared them to rice. I just stole this off the web. Um, Comparing to a drop to a grain of rice, they're a little bit bigger, whereas mouth droppings are a little bit smaller. We also have native rats. They are, these are called wood rats. Um, some people call them pack rats, but that's a different species. So we have desert wood rats and bushy-tailed wood rats. I like to call them North America's answer to a chinchilla because they are kind of cute. I mean, look at that guy. He's, he's a pretty cute little buddy. They live in rocky areas and woodlands. Uh, you're not gonna really see them in urban environments, but you will see them in suburban areas, particularly those places on the edge of the wildland interface. They are nocturnal. They are not commensal. They are very solitary. So that's a good thing. If you just have one, or if you see one, that's pretty much the only one you have to worry about. They do hibernate. In their native environment, they're looking for nuts, fruits, and vegetables. In your yard, they're gonna be looking at your garden fruits and nuts and any grain or feed that you might have around. They're not really high on the list of pest species when it comes to damage around fruits and crops. 
but they do have that pack rat ability of creating these massive nests of crazy materials. And um, the, on the bottom right hand corner, you can see that that is a native wood rat midden. It's huge. It's about three feet in, so in width and about two and a half feet tall. This one just has pine cones and leaves in it, but you'll also see them with tinsel and candy bar wrappers and ribbon, balloons, whatever. Um, and it just builds over time. Their feces look a lot like the commensal rat feces, so it's not really easy to distinguish one between the other that way. Um, basically, this is really what you want to look for. If you have any vehicles that are that you're not using on a regular basis, maybe you go away for the winter and then come back to a stored vehicle, check your vehicle first, because we do have this problem. Um, we've also had issues of people having outside furniture and coming back from being away to find that a wood rat has taken home up in one of the drawers of their outside furniture. So that's really where the issue comes from is the nesting, not so much the feeding. There's a lot out there on the internet for you to discover about managing rats. Most of this is geared toward our commensal non-native rats. I would say just exclude them from your grains and foods and seeds by using animal proof storage containers. You can exclude them from any areas with a gap greater than a half an inch. And you have to use that steel woven mesh. A lot of times most people will just hire a contractor, a nuisance wildlife control officer to do that for them. It's because they have the materials to get in there and exclude all those cracks. You can put woven wire mesh around any uh, trees that you're seeing bark being scratched off of, but uh, usually you don't, that's not the damage you see from rats. The toxicants registered for rats are the same as what's registered for mice. And they usually come these days in a box like this for suburban and urban environments. Um, and the grain goes in here or the bait goes in here, the animal comes in, takes the bait and goes back out uh, with bromethylene and colocalciferol. Again, it's a one, a one dose thing. So they just have to take one bit of bait and they leave and uh, you should see a reduction in rats over time. Some people that have barns and some larger properties might benefit from having a barn cat or encouraging barn owls. Um, there's very few pests out there that I would say, go ahead and get a cat or an owl, uh, but this one tends to work. If you're considering using trapping, those little snap traps are getting a little bit too small to actually lethally kill a rat. If anything, you're gonna maim it and not kill it. So I recommend using tube traps or uh, snap traps that are specific for rats. And they'll say that on the packaging. These tube traps have the same mechanism of the snap trap. It's just right here in the middle of the tube. So this rat comes in, the snap trap comes down, there's a cervical dislocation and the animal dies. And uh, the tube traps are nice because then you don't have a dead animal hanging out waiting for your cat or dog or child to discover it. So it's a little bit cleaner and safer to use around pets and kids. Similar to the mice, just remove bird seed waste. If you have a bird feeder, please take in your pet food at night. You should be doing that anyway. And then remove ground cover like vines. Uh, that's something people don't really think about, but if you have like Virginia creeper or some sort of ivy that grows heavy along a wall or along your fence line, like a trumpet vine, the rats can actually build nests in there and, and live quite happily. So you might just trim them back, keep them thin instead of a big mass. Similar to mice, please don't clean up feces and waste of rats without personal protective equipment. You can go to the CDC website and look up specifically what you need, but gloves, an aerating mask would be good. 
And then any place where there's feces or waste, clean it with bleach or clean it with boiling hot water. And that should kill any of the bacteria or fungus that you're dealing with. But some of these diseases that they can spread are pretty serious. So we, we wanna stay really, really careful when dealing with their waste. Okay, next in size, we have tree squirrels. Tree squirrels are, uh, again, kind of a new species for the Intermountain West. They have adapted to life around humans and moved with them um, across the United States. So what you see here is a fox squirrel and it is native to the Eastern United States. Uh, predominantly, you're gonna see them in parks and open spaces but they can very happily live in your backyard if you've got trees in your backyard. They're active during the day and they are active year round. Uh, similar to some of our other smaller mammals, they can estivate, meaning that they, if it's hot, they'll, they'll sleep a lot through the heat of the day. And then in the winter, if it gets really cold, they will hibernate um, when they just get up to eat. So none of these small mammals have enough energy reserves to sleep for three months at a time. They sleep for maybe two or three weeks at a time. And in the case of squirrels, get up, find all the nuts that they cached and come eat them and then go back to sleep for a few more weeks. In their native environment, they'd be eating seeds, nuts, barks, berries, uh, worms, roots, things like that. But they've adapted to human source food such as peanut butter crackers really, really well. Um, we do have problems with people wanting to feed them nuts and things like that. I would discourage that. We don't really want squirrels living in close proximity to us. Most of the damage that we're going to see is in the spring and the summer to our crops, whether they're garden veggies or orchard crops. But we can see the damage like you see here in the top right hand corner. And this um, is from a squirrel peeling off the bark. So that's something that they do in the winter when they have nutritional demands that aren't met by the food that they were able to store in the winter time. And then another weird thing that they do um, that's just came up over the past few months for me is they chew cement and cement like structures. So if they have a mineral deficiency, they will lick or chew uh, features. So like right here is a water fountain and all this is squirrel damage. The easiest way to handle that is to put out a mineral block like you would put out for a hamster and the squirrels will chew on the mineral block and leave your cement alone. The feces are similar in size to rats, not mice. I'm not sure why I put mice in there. And these are the larger, now that we're getting into larger animals, you'll actually be able to distinguish their tracks. So I put a picture of their tracks in there and it's a very typical four, four paw pattern that you'll see. Excluding tree squirrels are really difficult because they can jump and soar six and eight feet. And uh, so if you, the only way to really exclude them is if you have a situation where you have a tree that's six feet from your house you might be able to exclude them from access to that tree by putting up metal flashing like you see in this picture here. And this metal flashing is about three feet off the ground and about two feet wide. And that's so that the squirrel can't jump from the ground over the flashing and then access the tree. You can exclude them from your attics or crawl spaces uh, by using a wire mesh that is at least, or less than an inch and a half wide. Again, you, they just need to get their head in and then they can get the rest of their bodies in. Some people report using strobe lights. I kind of think that strobe lights might have a limited effect at frightening squirrels um, only because if you're in a suburban environment, I'm willing to bet you and your neighbors will not really appreciate strobe lights going off uh, in the twilight hours. There's some repellents on the market that are geared toward repelling squirrels, such as capsaicin or hot sauce and naphthalene, which are mothballs. They really have limited effect. Uh, they're best used in short term. So if you're seeing damage 
or there's, for example, you need to get them out for a very limited amount of time, that might work. But if you're looking at repellents for a three month period, you're really not gonna see that much of an effect. Along the Intermountain West where squirrels are not native, you can trap them lethally to remove them from your area. And we've definitely seen that a lot more often in Utah. And the best way to do this is through the use of tube traps. Again, snap traps are not big enough to get to actually kill the squirrel, you'll just wind up hurting the squirrel and that's not humane. So a uh, picture over here on the right hand side is a tube trap available on the market uh, for squirrels. They run about $50 a piece, but you can use them over and over and over again. I, you're not allowed to do capture and relocate. You can capture it out of your attic and release it on site on your property while you're excluding animals from your attic but you can't capture it and then relocate it to a different property somewhere. We don't want the squirrels to have a disease and then you move it someplace else and that disease is now someplace else. So we, we discourage capture, release, relocate. Habitat modification is again, it's gonna be tricky if anybody's ever lived around squirrels, you know that they're pretty clever and they're very tenacious. So again, you can trim trees so that they're six feet away from your house. Um, and then the biggest issue we have are squirrels eating bird seed, right? So you can install clever bird feeders or just remove the bird feeders altogether. We also have sometimes have situations where squirrels will dig up bulbs to get at those tubers, in which case you can um, try to use some sort of metal flashing around your, your bulbs. That it's just really hard to exclude them because they can climb up and over most of the fencing. Okay, moving on to our next little wildlife pest, uh, cottontail rabbits. Cottontail rabbits, I would think that most of the people in the audience probably don't have too much issue, but there's always somebody that's going to have some cottontail rabbits, particularly if you live along a park or along a golf course. In the native environments, they live in rangelands where there's lots of grass or green spaces. They are crepuscular, meaning they're out at dawn and dusk and nocturnal. And they do hibernate. They will make burrows like you see here on the upper left, but it's not a warren system that you have in Europe. It's just a very short burrow where they hide from the winter and they rear their young. Their native food are green plants and twigs and bark. And they shelter in bushes or in these little burrows. In our backyards, they're gonna be looking at our green plants and twigs and bark, but they're also going to be sheltering in brush piles or bushes, those scraggly vines that we talked about with, with rats. Um, and sometimes they will make burrows with young within those bush piles or with underneath those bushes. Their tracks are really easy to distinguish. They've got this really fun Y pattern where they have uh, their two front paws are here. And then they kind of, as they're jumping, they swing their back feet over their bodies. And so their back feet tracks are actually in front of their front feet. Um, and it creates a loose Y pattern in the tracks. Their pellets are actually very distinctive. Um, they're the only ones really that you're gonna see in the backyard that are round pellets. So you might have jackrabbits in your yard if you live uh, closer to rangeland and they're gonna kind of have the same problems and the same issues. So we'll just focus on cottontails and assume you can do the same thing with jackrabbits. This is kind of what rabbit damage looks like. Uh, they really like the buds of, and new shoots coming up in people's yards particularly your gardens and your ornamental plants. You can distinguish rabbit herbivory uh, by the pattern of the bite. So if you notice here on this tulip, the bite goes straight across. And if you were to look here, I think might be the remnants of basil plants. Uh, there, it's this 45 degree angle straight cut on all of these. And that's very indicative of a rabbit. 
So what you can do is modify your habitat by reducing any brush piles or debris. If you have a wood pile, make sure it's stacked nicely instead of like just a big pile of wood. You can also plant different species of plants. Um, I'm looking through my notes here because I wrote down exactly which ones you want to plant. Um, daffodils for sure. Also sweet alyssum, lantana, snapdragons, begonias, and milkweed. So basically anything that's very sappy and anything that's pokey, the rabbits will stay away from. So you can plant those as ornamental perennials as opposed to things like tulips, which they love and they eat all the time. You can exclude them if you're experiencing bark damage in the winter time, just a 24 inch high wire mesh fencing or even just wrapping the fruit trees will help them. Repellents such as the capsaicin and some predator urines like bobcat or coyote urine will repel them for short periods of time. There's kind of a mixed effects about that. Repellents are hard because in the Intermountain West, our climate is so dry and also so hot in the summertime that the chemical structure of the repellent breaks down really quickly. So you have to reapply a lot. It's also hard in wet environments because as soon as it rains, it washes the repellent away, and then you have to reapply. You can trap them in cage traps like you see here in the middle photo. And um, that's really easy, especially if it's gotten into the garden and you want it the fenced in area and you want to get it out of your fenced in area. But know that you cannot trap and relocate in most places. Um, you would have to trap and then find a humane way to euthanize. And to my knowledge, the only thing accessible to you would be to take it to a veterinarian that can euthanize it. If you're in a rural, or I'm sorry, a, yeah, a rural area, you can shoot it, um, but then you have to really look at the laws in your state and your county. Rabbits are a game species, a fur-bearing species, so there could be limits and restrictions on shooting them out of season, even if they are considered a pest species. So you have to be really, really careful and contact your Division of Wildlife Resources and figure out what those laws are before you go about doing lethal control with rabbits in your yard. Okay, moving on to striped and spotted skunks. Striped and spotted skunks are, again, more of a, a growing problem in the area. Most of the time, skunks are more of just a scare problem. People just are afraid to have them in their yard, but they're not really causing that much of a problem. Recently, we are seeing more and more actual physical damage from skunks. They are in suburban and urban areas, um, but in their native environment, it would be woodlands and grasslands. They are very much nocturnal and they do hibernate, particularly in the Northern uh, states or even just, you know, North Utah versus South Utah, they would be hibernating in Northern Utah. Their natural food are grubs, insects, amphibians, and eggs, but they have incorporated pet food into their diet. This is a problem because in places like Arizona, skunks carry rabies. So they can transmit rabies to your pets through your pet food. In Utah and Nevada, we don't really have a problem with skunk rabies, but that's as of right now. So it's best just to get in the habit of not getting having your pet food accessible just in case rabies move into the area. In native environments, they would be nest, they would burrow for a quick nest or just simply sleep under the bushes. But in suburban environments, they love uh, making burrows to hibernate underneath cement pads or under your outbuildings. And these are just shallow burrows where two or three skunks might come together to stay warm through the winter. Most of our damage is gonna be spring and summer. They are a really good indicator that your lawn is infested with grubs. So you should be thanking them for letting them know that your lawn's infested with grubs. So they go into a front lawn and they'll dig up all the grubs in your lawn. Uh, unfortunately, they also love to kill chickens and eat the eggs. So you can see them here in the top left-hand corner 
climbing a fence to get into a chicken coop. The feces look like cat feces, but they won't be buried. So cats like to bury their feces. Skunks don't care. So that's how you know that it's a skunk and not a cat. They also have really long claws. So you can see evidence of scratching on a um, track that's about one and a half inch long. Here's some of the damage that you might see uh, in chicken coops. They're, it's very common for them to go into the chicken coop, kill all of the chickens, but don't eat them, and then take all the eggs. You'll also see this grubbing behavior in your lawn. Um, this is distinctive because it's a conical shaped hole that's about two to three inches deep where they're just getting at the grubs. So it's a good indicator that you need lawn treatment. And then finally, again, they, they love eating cat food and dog food, so don't leave that out. Usually you're just gonna have to exclude them from your chicken coops. Uh, any, my, with the, any wire mesh that's less than an inch and a half wide will work. You have to set it a few feet tall. And then you also have to set it six to eight inches under the ground, either straight down or kind of horizontal to the ground as an apron so that if they try to get under the fence and pop back the other side, they still hit that mesh. Some people will electrify their, their uh, fences like you see here in the top right, just a few inches off of the ground so that when the skunk does try to climb the fence, it does get electrocuted. This method will also help you with raccoons that we'll talk about in a second. You have to seal all of your openings to your crawl spaces. Um, if you have a low-lying deck that has a couple inch gap from the ground, you might want to put woven mesh wire uh, between the top or between the bottom of the deck and the ground. And again, you have to dig that in a few inches so that the skunks just can't dig under it. For trapping online, if you were to look, you'd see a lot of different types of trapping for skunks. They are a fur-bearing animal, so people do uh, trap them legally for their pelts. In urban situations or suburban situations, I would not suggest live trapping a skunk uh, unless you really, really have to, because then you have to move it um, without getting sprayed. And then you have to find a way to legally euthanize it. And um, for those of you, and not, no pointing fingers, but Drowning an animal in a trap is not a legal way to euthanize an animal. It's considered inhumane. So we try to steer away from doing that. Instead, what you can do is use a body gripping trap like I, you see here on the bottom right hand side. In this trap, the skunk hits these two tines and the trap collapses and compresses the body in two different places uh, for a relatively quick kill, pretty much instantaneous kill, um, it, a cervical dislocation, and then a compression of the body cavity. And there are ways to, and things on the market where you set this trap inside of a tube-like structure so that the skunk goes to get bait. And much like the tube traps of the squirrels and, and then gets captured into that kind of bear trap. <laughs> um, other habitat modifications are if you have a beehive, I've, I've heard of people having problems with skunks getting into their beehives. You wanna set the beehives up on stilts and make sure the bottom, the base of that is covered with wire mesh or flashing into the ground. Um, I have had to untrap a live trap skunk. So just for a quick break, I am going to try to share that with you. It'll just take me a second. So we'll go back there. Go here, oops, not that one, gosh. Okay, so it's a little bit fuzzy and you'll get the gist. Make sure you wear clothes that you don't mind throwing away just in case this doesn't work.
There you go, the skunk walks away. Nobody got sprayed. It was a very happy situation. Can happen. Um, this would be a good strategy to use if you thought that you excluded a skunk from your chicken coop, which was the case with this neighbor of mine, and the skunk got in anyway. So we got the skunk out and then fixed the exclusion of the chicken coop. Raccoons are a similar pest in that they like to raid chicken coops, but they're uh, much more clever and much more just an all around rascally kind of pest, as we all know. Sometimes they can range in family groups, but most of the time they're just single. In the native environment, they lived in the Eastern deciduous forest of North America, but as they acclimated to living with humans and humans increased their density across the landscape westward, they moved westward as well. The first incidence of a trapped raccoon was in 1983 in Utah. So it's a relatively new species for the Intermountain West. These guys are nocturnal and they're active year round, but because a lot of our winters are pretty harsh, they're less active. They will hibernate for long periods of time in your attic or under your crawl spaces, things like that. They are an absolute omnivore. They'll eat anything, but they've really become accustomed to eating human sourced food through our trash cans and our rubbish piles. In their native environment, they nest in trees in the forest or in logs, but in suburban and urban areas, they love attics, outbuildings, bushes, crawl spaces, pretty much wherever they can find a warm place to sleep. They don't have any dens unless they are rearing young, in which case they do need some sort of permanent place to rear their young, which in urban areas often is somebody's attic. So that's where we have a lot of problems with raccoons. Their tracks are really easy to identify. They essentially look like a small hand that's about three inches wide. Their feces are really easy to identify as well. Um, it looks like a very large cat feces that again isn't buried. So, and you'll also see bits and pieces of everything that the raccoon has eaten, including candy wrappers in the feces. The damage that we usually see is just all around being a bugger, getting into garbage, things like that. Um, but they'll also eat pet food and they can carry rabies. So then again, it's a really good argument against keeping your pet food outside. Uh, they will raid your garden crops. So they love fruits and vegetables and nuts. And then they will raid coops for chicken eggs, but they also will eat and consume some of the chickens. And this is what it looks like. You can see once they get inside of a building, they pretty much destroy it. They don't want to be in the building. So they just basically annihilate it, trying to get back out. Um, and you'll notice that they can chew and open up any gap that you have in order for them to get into that gap and make a nest for their young. Similar to skunks, the best thing to do for exclusion is to try to build a fence that they can't get over or under. <clears throat> six, feet six feet high is a good recommendation. That's a lot of fence. Um, so you might wanna just try uh, a fence with a little bit of electricity in it. Again, you're going to need an apron underneath that, that chain fence to keep them from digging under and just popping up the other side. We like to use have a heart live traps. Well, have a heart's a brand, but in general, that's what they're called. They look like that. Uh, particularly if we're trying to get the animal out of a human structure prior to continuing with your exclusion. So they put the trap door in, they let the raccoon come out and then they can release the raccoon on site. Again, you cannot release the raccoon off location. And if you want to do lethal control, um, there's not really a whole lot of options for you other than seeing a vet in an urban and suburban environment. And <clears throat> once the animal's out of your building, you can try putting up the wire mesh. Um, that it has to, you're lucky in this case, they have big heads. So a wire mesh that's two inches to two and a half inches wide 
will suffice. And you just sort of put that up over the hole to keep the raccoons from going back in. Um, we recommend people putting these uh, woven wire mesh over the entrances to their chimneys because it's very common for the raccoons to get into the house that way. So you wanna be careful there. Again, removing pet food is a great way to remove food resources from raccoons access. Also, you can get rabbit raccoon proof trash cans and make sure you're closing any openings to your house. Uh, we also have, um, my favorite new thing is called a water scarecrow. And I'm gonna let you see that. Nikki, I'm just gonna interrupt you for a second. It's, yeah. It's about a minute to one o'clock. So, oh gosh, did I go that fast? Yeah. Ooh, um, okay. So those of you that need to leave at one, I'm putting in the chat the link to the evaluation and information on a CEU credit for Utah and Nevada. So you can click on that link. And I am very say, sorry. No, that's okay. You can maybe show the video. And I don't know if you have any more after this, but we have a lot of questions as well. Yeah, let me, I'll just skip the video and go on. I apologize. Last time I practiced this, I was done in 45 minutes. So I apparently had a lot more to say this time. So uh, let me just go back. We don't need to see this. We'll just go back to the PowerPoint presentation and um, we'll start answering some questions. <clears throat> 